It's up to deck. How you doing, guys? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> watching a film but then all of a sudden we're in a film. Roughly 5,000 metres above sea level. To give you an idea, that's about 700 metres on top of Kilimanjaro. Grease is still going. Hi everyone uh, back home. Hello to my wife in the kitchen. Uh, my mum and dad are in lockdown in Scotland and uh, mother-in-law and father-in-law are in lockdown in Kent. I'm going to share this screen. Uh, is that right? I've got to be careful. I'm actually quite nervous. I've never done it at the presentation to, to a way you can't see the audience. And it's always curious to think what everyone's doing back home in the comfort of their own living room. Uh, I can only imagine what people are states are undressed people are sat in but um i wanted to do uh, a talk on i guess fundamentally fundamentally my trip that started me off back here 10 years ago now so it's, it's talking about an old story really uh but it back from sydney uh, to london on a 105 cc australian uh, postal bike uh called dorothy that was twenty three thousand miles uh, nine months eight, 18 countries and then on across America. Uh, I think the first picture, you know, I think it's always important to, to, to thrash through where people started in their biking careers because uh, none of us just got on a bike and did a big trip. Everyone sort of built up to it. So I think this is me when I was about three or four on a, an Ital jet or something like that, just cruising around the garden. And then for me, I went on to 16, uh, the mighty AR50, uh, topped out at 31 miles an hour. Uh, I had that for a year and then on to uh, a TZR, Yamaha TZR 125, 28 brake horsepower, uh, flying machine, wrote the first one off, 17 and a half, and then bought another one at 18. But uh, I had quite a long hiatus then, really. I, I didn't ride a bike for maybe 10 years. So, you know, I can't say I was a, I was a passionate biker. Maybe I was when I was younger, uh, certainly 16, 17, that freedom you got. But, you know, as a 16, 17 year old, I always thought that riding sort of 15 miles to Matlock was a big adventure. I never would have even thought of riding to Skegness. Uh, I mean, we went on holiday many times to Skegness, but I never would have thought riding a TZR uh, to uh, Skegness. So I guess we all start with quite limited uh, horizons on how far we think we can ride or how far we think the machine we've got can take us. And that was certainly my case with me and my friend Mark. We, he had an RG125 and we used to razz around to Matlock, but you know, sort of 30 miles a day, uh, and we thought we'd uh, conquer the world. So, uh, step forward, I guess, 10 years and never been on a bike before, or, or again, uh, to 2009, uh, sat in uh, residential Balmain, Sydney. So, I've been out to Australia a few times, uh, a few, you know, ups and downs with things, trying to settle there, but not ever really uh, making it stick. And, and then, ultimately, uh, coming to the end of, of a visa, uh, having to leave Australia, but not really having at that time anything to head back for. Uh, I got the Aussie post bike just to get, I was working cash in hand in a, in a, city, in a city, in a, in a cafe in, in, in Sydney. And I bought the postie bike for about $1,200 on eBay. And uh, I used to just razz around the city. And then, uh, you know, in, in all honesty, in the back of my mind for probably a year before that, I, would, I was planning this big trip on a motorcycle. You know, I'd, I guess I'd seen a long way around, so I'd seen that was possible. And I'd seen, uh, I got a friend in Australia who worked in the car magazines who'd once ridden around Australia on a 105cc uh, Honda CT110. So I knew you could do a big trip. I knew you could do it on a small bike. You know, and the guy who'd been around Australia on it, he just sort of sold it as this really exciting, easy, happy-go-looking, go lucky adventure that was possible on a very small bike it made it cheap it made it accessible it made it affordable and so i sort of put his trip together with this uh, long distance uh, sydney to london type affair and originally i thought about riding to australia bottled it got a plane spent a bit of time in australia and then when it was time to come home and immigration said look you've got to go it was like okay i've got a bike um and, and at that time i'd only got sort of three days to go from uh, leaving the cafe job to setting off. I decided to do it on the Thursday and left on the Sunday. Um, and, and that bike there was pretty much everything I owned upon it. You know, the, there's lots of pros and cons to a, a small bike. Um, for somebody who was mechanically naive as I, I was back then, I didn't really know anything about anything. I mean, that bike is it, got, you got, you won't see it, but it's got a knackered bottom end. It got a battered, you know, broken spoke it back wheel. Headlight weren't really working very well. But then all of a sudden I thought, I'll, I'll try and ride this thing to England. Um, 
and the, the reason I was able to do it in such short notice, go from deciding to do it to actually leaving three days later, I guess because I've done a lot of research uh, in that time. So I think when it comes to planning a trip, the most thing, important thing I think is, is you do your research. You know, you, you really stem through all the forums, all the, all the Googling to find out what visas you, you might need for the countries ahead, what carne you might need, how you can get carne if you're not in your home country, what alternative routes there might be, say if you can't get through around, well, how do I get to China? So I guess that day when I left Sydney, I was completely naive and, and daunted by this huge task ahead of me. But then at the same time, I got sort of a, ro a rough roadmap that I knew would, if I followed that, would take me to England. And actually, once I'd set off that day, terrified as it, as it was, riding over Sydney Harbour Bridge, thinking, my God, I know that I'm not going to stop till I get to England. You know, I, I kind of, it, it kind of all just flowed. And, and it kind of wasn't as difficult. There were difficult times, but the overall process of doing a trip like that, actually, kind of straightforward, you know. Back in real world, dealing with bills and mortgages and, and all that sort of thing, that's a far more, seems a far more complex uh, process. But actually just getting on a bike, deciding to ride from here to there, is actually quite easy, whether you're riding from here to you know, Matlock or from here to, to Australia. It's kind of a similar process. So I set off, uh, now, I don't know if you can see that. So I, I took a route that was up to Darwin, uh, up through Indonesia, about from Darwin to, to uh East Timor, then into West Timor, then along the Indonesian islands, Sumatra, Flores. Uh, top of Sumatra, I've got a boat, a banana boat, a, I think, you know, some sort of smuggler's vessel, Mr. Lim, uh, who, who comes up on the Horizons Unlimited forum every now and again. You know, how do I get a boat, uh, a bike from Malaysia to Indonesia? Ask for Mr. Lim and he'll, he'll be able to help you. You know, it's tip bits like that that really, you know, help you on the way. Um, I said to Malaysia, Thailand. I mean, back then, Myanmar wasn't a possibility, so I had to fly the bike over, uh, which is kind of cheating. But you know, if you ain't got no, if there's no alternative, there's no alternative. So I flew the bike into uh, Kathmandu for about two or three hundred dollars. And I guess that's the beautiful thing. I just saw I do a before and after shot. So this is about three days in, serious, moody, shaven, and then this is a photo at the end. <laughs> and, and I love that contrast of yeah, nine months, but it's probably like I look like a, an old man on that one slightly fried in every sense but you know for me the excitement of doing that trip was just the the, the energy to, uh, and the the the, the, the challenge that it, that it was you know i didn't really stop to dwell on things or look around i just was on a mission to get this posty bike to england come what man you know um and, and so i didn't have a lot of money uh, i mean people talk about budgets what does it cost to go around the world you know this it probably ended up costing about eight thousand pounds so this is an expensive trip and that was with a few bailouts from my parents who thankfully who were watching and they can take great credit for that um but you know you've even doing it on a cheap bike in a cheap way camping wild eating cheap on the streets you've still got huge car, huge costs in terms of your carne de passage or your shipping costs your visa costs visa for pakistan was 110 carne was like a thousand dollars uh shipping from east Team, darwin to east timor was like 400 dollars and i think that's doubled since flying over back burma you've got you know another four five hundred dollars so all these costs stack up so even if you're living on 10 pounds a day which is possible in asia you're still spending multiple times that to get through places china was two thousand dollars for uh, an eight-day crossing which is ridiculous but if you can't get into iran you've got to go through china so yeah that's a before and after but just setting off i, I just kind of just want to show you some of the pictures as i, as I rode through australia i like like everyone else i just I took everything i put, possibly could think of uh, you might notice there is a slight change in the bike. A thousand kilometres into the trip in Brisbane, the bottom end did fail. And I went into a bike shop, 110 motorcycles uh, in Caboolture, just outside Brisbane. And he said, look, I'll trade your bike in uh, for this posty bike. Exactly the same bike, but just with a large tank on it. And it was just in a lot better condition. He says, you know, if, you, if you're serious about getting a, a posty bike to England, which I was, then this is the bike for you. Uh, and this is Dorothy. She'd done 40,000 kilometres. They all used to deliver the mail. And then once they finished delivering mail, they get uh, retired off and that's when you can buy them. And the guy who bought this uh, in its retirement had obviously looked after it really well, put a good chain on it, serviced it well, put a big tank on it, off an XR250. You know, and that's so sometimes a limitation with a small bike. You haven't got a big tank range. Standard tank range on a post is like, you know, 90 miles, 100 miles, which is not enough when you've got 500 miles to do in a day and you can only do 40 miles an hour and you're going across the outback where there's not a great deal out there. So a bigger tank is one of the most essential uh, up, upgrades to a small bike and the beauty of having a big tank that's plumbed into the carburetor rather than the external cans is that you don't have to stop to refill you can just turn the tap go into reserve tank 
and that would do me about 300 kilometers so about 200 miles so you know we had some wild times going across the outback it was wet season but uh, i only had a limited time to get to darwin so as soon as i set off from sydney i was riding full pace and that's probably why the bottom, the bottom end went on the first bike within the first thousand miles so i've got that thing pinned all the way up from sydney uh, up through coffs harbour uh, by byron bay then by the time it got into brisbane it was kind of on its last leg so dorothy thousand mile oil changes and keeping it below 40 miles 40 miles an hour and she sailed from uh, sydney to uh, england needing uh, not needing anything really by the time I got to england need uh, piston rings clutch plates and a cam chain and that was it. But, uh, you know, it's going to flick through. I probably put too much photos in. Uh, I didn't really, I probably oversaturated the photos. But, you know, Indonesia was challenging. That was interesting. A real baptism of fire. You know, it's easy to present these stories as, as, a, as an adventurous, uh, brave thing to do. But I was terrified uh, of landing somewhere like East Timor, realising that I was on a bike, not knowing where I was going to stay or, you know, how I was going to get to the top of Indonesia. But I, was, I was kind of terrified and very anxious and very nervous and untrusting of people uh, who I met along the way. So it, only t it takes time before you start to feel uh, the confidence of, of, of a long distance traveler. And the only way you can do it is by doing it. Uh, and I was really helped by the fact that I was in at the deep end. I didn't have no time to sort of say, oh, shall I shan't I? It was like, if I don't leave today, I'm, there, I'm not ready to do this trip. So I had no time. I sort of cut out all that uh, second guessing that we all do when we're trying to decide whether we should do the trip or not. So, you know, by the time I got into Thailand, I was, I was like, this is kind of fun. And I wrote Song Crown was on the Thai Water Festival to celebrate New Year, which is in mid April. So, everyone in Bangkok has just got water pistols and super soakers and water balloons. And they're just, you know, the, the, the sort of city is lit up with this great atmosphere of, of, of celebration. And, you know, for me, that was kind of that. Those, stumbling upon those things were the real highlight for me and you know the beauty of looking like a, a, a nerd I say knob but the beauty of looking like a knob on a bike is that nobody really takes you as a threat or as an intimidation source of intimidation you now when you got a I mean that that was a, I bought that helmet cheap in Thailand that was a 10 pound helmet and you got shorts on and a, you know your, your best Burton's uh, formal menswear shirt and some sandals flip-flops you know, nobody really can see you as either a source of great rob, reason to rob or as, as, a, as any sort of intimidation. So the beauty of a small bike in places like that is that generally the population have got better bikes than you are. So the chances of them wanting to steal what you're riding is, is minimal. And also, obviously, the fuel is cheap because you're not paying a lot of fuel money. And, um, you know, I guess it's easy, it's easy riding. You're not, the speed of traffic out there is pretty slow. So you're riding at a slow pace naturally. If you're on a faster bike and you've got a deadline to me, you would ride faster and run a bigger risk of accident. Obviously, there's a fine line. If your bike can't keep up with traffic, then it can, you can become a hazard, as it happened across America. But, you know, another great thing of the small bike, when you need to pack it up and put it in a box and fly it to Kathmandu from Bangkok, you know, you, you get it in a small, tiny box that goes on uh, volume weight rather than actual size. And so that makes it very cheap as well. You know, I'd probably pay double the price if I was shipping by Himalayan or something. Uh, like that so if you want to you know even at eight thousand pounds that's a lot of money so if you take a more expensive bike you're going to pay a lot more money also things like you can't aid a passage is worked out on the value of the bike the posty wasn't worth a lot if you took a bike that's twice as much money you're going to be paying two thousand dollars for your car aid, some of which you get back as opposed to a thousand uh, also you can't really insure a bike out in the in the world when you go through india and thailand your bike is not insured so if it's stolen or written off goodbye eight thousand pound bike that you just bought or five thousand pound bike you know dorothy gets written off in the middle of thailand you kind of walk away and you, you've not lost your you know shirt off your back type thing so i'm not saying that small bikes are the best way because they're not always but sometimes they can allow somebody who's mechanically inept and poor or lacking of serious funds to do a trip that's probably bigger than what they initially thought they could do so you know i came into nepal tough time we kind of think india is kind of a wearisome place uh, I was watching a video by Ed March this morning he's in, when he went through India on a C90. It was a great reminder of sort of the, 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 the hard work it is going through India, especially through that midsection, you know, when you're sweeping across country through the industrial area where it's just kind of rough going, uh, quite in your face, hot and bothering. 
But, uh, you know, at the top really, I went over the Himalayas, Manali to Leh Highway on a seven brake horsepower uh, machine that is not a lot of power. And so you'd often have to get off and push the motorcycle in first gear, held out, held it fl flat out in first gear until you got to the top of the hill, jump on it and then ride down the other side before pushing it up the next mountain, which is kind of exhausting. But, you know, as I, as I heard the sidecars guys talking about going through the, the you know, Siberian things in the middle of winter, I guess we all have our struggles uh, with nature on the road but uh, I, I guess with the struggle comes a re reward which is a bit cliche I guess but hey all adventurers are into cliche sentiments and statements so I may as well do one as well uh, yeah but the Manali Lake Highway is fantastic section of road it's going to be paved or it's going to be tunneled at some point so get in there fast and do it while you can you know I crossed into Pakistan which was a real eye opener I didn't you know I was nervous about Pakistan again that fear of like oh my god I'm out of my depth I'm out of my depth what am I doing in Pakistan and then you get to Pakistan and people are cool and, and, and this is the main road up to China Karakoram Highway obviously you can't go into Iran which is the most common route back to England uh, Pakistan around Turkey if you can't go that way you gotta go north into China pay you two thousand dollars to met, be met by a, a guy at the border who's escorts you for a six days and, and as you pulls your pants down and gives you a, you know a smack in a two thousand dollars and lets you on your way so it's a bit of big of a bit of a fob off with China but it is what it is so this is a cow of corn you know and I, I kind of went local as I came through Pakistan got my Salwa Kameez on in the hope of uh, just going beneath the radar a little bit. I'd also took the orange pannier sacks off and replaced it with some more subtle black panniers, which I thought would help me blend in. But there's no way you can blend in when you're on a bright red orange, uh, bright red posty bike uh, riding through northern Pakistan, uh, even if you're wearing a salwar kameez. But, you know, I did my best. Uh, well, you know, it was, it was good fun going through northern Pakistan. Uh, into Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan's a great place if you've got a dirt bike and you want to do some dirt bike riding out there. I think there's companies now that rent bikes out there and there's so many trails and mountain passes to do off-roading. You know, you can stay in the yurts with, with, with the families out there. Cheap travelling. It's a long way to ride out, you know, if you, if you haven't got the time, but you can fly into Bishkek, the capital. I'm sure there's plenty of rental companies out there that rent you a small dirt bike. You know, 10 days in the mountains in Kyrgyzstan, you'd have a right, you know, right good old time. So, uh, you know, and I, you'd meet people, this guy just on horseback, who just stopped and he uh, wrote me his address down to send him a picture. And I, unfortunately, I never sent it uh, because I couldn't really read his writing, but uh, he was a nice chap and just wanted to have a chat. And again, you know, the small little bite, you, you kind of, you're a curiosity to people, which, which uh, you know, I liked. And um, I got me, I, I, I kind of were low key, you know, my gloves weren't very good, so I got a pair of socks to keep my hands warm as we come through Kazakhstan. Uh, Miss Salmon Pink Suit, which was given to me by a bike shop owner in Nepal because he took pity on me for being uh, soaking wet because it was raining. And I, I, I sent my, I'd sent my waterproofs back home in Bangkok because I didn't, I didn't think there was going to be any rain west of there, which was probably the least intelligent manoeuvre I'd, I'd done. But uh, I met some German guys and they were on GSs and 800 and F650, which was interest, interesting. The contrast, they rode with me for a bit. You know, they were travelling as a couple. Uh, I guess as well as well loaded as I was and it was interesting that they could obviously just sip along at a good pace they tried riding with me for a few days and got bored senseless just carried on and then they kind of missed me and Dorothy a little bit so they waited and then we we rode the rest of the way across Kazakhstan together which was uh, I mean, it was this kind of road you know and again uh, every bike's got a compromise you're on a big bike they struggle through this section just because you know a big bike manhandling it through rutted rough unforgiving terrain for you know this went off like 100 kilometers you know uh i, I just you know dorothy, me and dorothy were just uh, it was like a playground for us but on their bikes it was difficult so you know when you're trying to make people try and d decide the perfect bike for this adventure you're just looking at a lesser lesser of many evils because you're gonna have to compromise somewhere there's gonna be a time when that perfect bike is imperfect uh and, and another bike can be better at some things and worse at others so uh, people overstress things far far too much which is an easy trap to get into you know i got my cheap stove a tin of sweet corn i got my skateboard trousers and a pair of converse you know i guess if i was doing that trip again i made me think again at what sort of footwear I, I used i might wear take some kevlar trousers with knee pads in but you know back then when you're doing it on the cheap pair of skateboard and trousers pretty good you know they were warm lasted well comfortable um and that, that's often what you want you know i, I guess i got a shabby sheet kind of look going on you know, I've not done it deliberately, but I guess I cultivated it very carefully over eight months. My scraggy hair and, and uncut, uncut uh, facial hair. And, I mean, I was wild. I was, I was just sleeping rough, sleeping wild. Uh, 
across Russia and Kazakhstan. It was just hedgerow sleep, sleeping, you know, um, ride all day. Because uh, I just wanted to get home by that point. I wanted to be in England. I didn't want to be in, coming to Russia. I wanted to be in England. So I'd ride all day, every day into darkness. And then, you know, I'd see a little gate in a, in a hedge, zip through there, turn the light off, put me a tent up, up which I would now lost a few poles, get in that and then sleep till about five o'clock. Light me a little stove in my tent to warm me up because it was cold. And then, and then I'd then be on the road again the next day by 6 a.m. and ride again till. 8 p.m. and that's kind of the routine that, that you need to get into to do big miles on a small bike and that's the unfortunate reality when people say oh small bikes are great you know people say not oh, c90s are the best adventure bike in the world no they're not because you, you to do 400 miles in a day you've got to ride like 14 hours so uh, you know uh be realistic uh about uh, about our uh, our, our good purposeful or perfect they are but uh, she was good on steed you know dorothy i've still got her got ninety eight thousand kilometers on the clock uh and you know for me i spent a few years after that trip just sort of chewing things over uh deciding a few things decide you know i kind of i don't know <laughs> drifting i had the luxury of drifting really i, I guess it's uh, uh you know i can't complain about things too much really um and then eventually i just oh, i've got to do another trip i've got to get back on dorothy I shipped it to America again, putting on a plane, a, a, what, putting a 95 kilo bike on a plane to America is far cheaper than putting on a, a 250 kilo uh, bike. So I think I paid 600 pounds to air freight it into JFK. And then, you know, you, you get around in um, New York City, you've got your 40 mile an hour steed and you think, well, I'm going to aim for San Francisco. And San Francisco feels like a long way away when you can't take the interstates or the big roads and you've got to meander through Detroit, Chicago, uh, St. Louis, you know, you're going through all the urban back streets where, um, you know, I kind of get, you see the the under underbelly. I think that's a derogatory derogatory term, which I don't really intend. To, but it's it's kind of the rough side of America that normally you would avoid. But being on such a small bike forces you to see it because, say, somewhere like Detroit, the interstate goes over all the poor parts to get to the nice part in the center. You can't go on the interstate. You've got to go through the poor parts to get to the bit in the centre, which gives a different perspective of things. Uh, whether you would choose that or whether you'd choose, you know, to jump on an 800cc bike instead, I'm not too sure. But if you're forced to do it in a certain way, the least you can do is, is uh, take the good from it. Um, but a bit of Route 66, you know, it's difficult to follow on a postie because a lot of it's interstate. Uh, you jump on and off it, kind of got frustrated. I just went west from St. Louis uh, on Lonely Highway, Highway 50, Took parts of the tap, which, you know, fantastic. Again, when you're on a little bike that's light and agile and thumbs along gently, is not intimidating to ride. You know, when you see the forum, the forums are so embarrassing for the adventure forums because they're all arguing about what's the best adventure bike. Should you have a DRZ 650 or a 400 or is a KTM 390 a good off-road bike? You think that's just absolute bollocks because, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter that much what you're riding as long as you're out there doing some riding. Uh, uh, and so I think we, as an adventure community, tend to tie ourselves in knots just a little bit when really we'd be better out there riding, whether it's on an imperfect bike or not. Uh, so, uh, you know, the tap, you could do this on a 390 Adventure, a Himalayan, an F800, a GS1200, anything you want to, you'd probably get down most of it. Again, there'd be compromises depending. But, uh, you know, the postie was pretty good, actually. The postie across America on the tap was probably the best part for the posting, you know, these old railway roads that cut through Colorado over the Rockies, you know, they were like raised sections that the, the railway, railway line had been removed and they were just brilliant. Uh, and then out to Monument Valley, you know, this is where the real good riding gets hit in America. You know, I do love America as a destination. And even if you've only got a week or 10 days, you're going to you have a great trip around America, America in these parts, Monument Valley, uh, you know, up through that's uh, coming up to or Silver, Silverton, uh, on the Million Dollar Highway, some some really good long gravelly, uh, easy to ride tracks up there, and then eventually San Francisco. You know, I'm pretty pleased with myself by the time I made it to San Francisco. Out of money by that point, so I quickly dashed up to uh, just go back, dashed up to Seattle, uh, left the bike there, came home, worked in uh, a cardboard box making factory in Leamington Spa um, for six six months, five months, I can't remember, and then. Went back out, I'd left the bike at uh, John and Natalie Wilkie, the friends I'd met on Facebook in Seattle. They, they looked after Dorothy. Went back to Seattle. Uh, I think, I, what do we have to do? Did a, a rebore, one oversized rebore, had the real, rear wheel relays because the spokes had been coming loose. And then carried on north uh, as far as I wanted to, really. And, and I went up through British Columbia, which is you know, a stunning 
place to ride uh, coming just coming out of winter so early spring kind of a nice crisp cold atmosphere which was uh, which meant the roads were pretty quiet but also uh, you know there's still got snow on the on the on the peaks of the uh, of the mountains and some of the lakes were still frozen um and it's kind of nippy but excitingly nippy because in a tent you'd be you wouldn't perish but you'd be cold and then in the morning you'd be glad when the sun come up so it made you grateful uh, any colder, I couldn't have done that. You know, when I see Ed, Ed and Marsh and Rachel Lasham's trip to Canada in the middle of winter at minus 40, I can't, I couldn't even comprehend doing anything like that. So, uh, you know, I, I kind of got gone back. I, I'd smartened up a little bit. I've got a smart uh, bike jacket and a pair of jeans uh, and some uh, I don't know, easy fit boots. Uh, and that's kind of how I've travelled, really. That's, you know, overloading your bike. Is it necessary? That's, that's everything I took on the, on the run up to Alaska. You know, I got like a change of clothes, a bit of some basic tools, tent, sleeping bag. Uh, you know, what do you need? Really, what do you need? You don't need. Some, I got some wellies. I think I've got a picture, a picture of some wellies soon. Uh, you know, and the same again. Um, oh, God, I forget. I forgot his name all of a sudden. Oh, blimey. Uh, Seth, he was going up to Alaska to work on a fishing boat on a KLR 650. You know, he just got some ammo cans and a throw, throw over bag. Done it cheap, cheap bike, cheap kit, great adventure. Uh, you know, you like living the dream. Uh, and same with, I met a guy called Calvin who was headed off to ship his bike to Russia and ride around the world that way. He was on the KLR 650 with mi minimal kit as well. So, you know, uh, they, were do they were doing it on the bike that suited their trip. Um, yeah, there's my wellies, you know, for when it rained, I got me a uh, high protective uh, boots on. The beauty of a bike that's uh, that going to do 40 miles an hour is that if you do have a slide, you know, it's like falling off a push bike. It's not theoretically going to hurt you too much. Um, and I got my postman's jacket on for visibility. And uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, there's a way of doing it and there's a way of not doing it, but as long as you're doing it. And I got to Alaska. I went over the border, got to Skagway. And kind of that was it then. I'd done my Sydney London trip. I'd done my New York to Alaska trip, even though I didn't go to. I was aiming for Fairbanks and Prudent Bay and all that, you know. And then I thought, I'm actually, I'm over this now. I really am done with this. I got to Skagway, it was a beautiful little uh, fishing port village old Klondike town. I loved it there. I stayed there for a week and then got the inland ferry, um, you know, back down to Vancouver. And I came home, I brought Dorothy home on a boat and uh, I got on with my life doing other things, really. Um, so, so that was it. But, you know, for me, long, long distance, big trip, small bike, there's plenty of people doing it uh, you know, around the world in 80 days on the Vespa. You know, this guy, I forget his name, but, you know, he's been everywhere recently. Uh, I mean, look at that for Kit. Look at the precision in his loading. It's just, you know, amazing, really. I don't envy him, but I, you know, wholeheartedly admire him. Uh, Sean Dillon, who did the Pan America on the C90, the Irish guy. Uh, you know, he's a great guy. And he, he just did it. You know, he just shipped his bike to Alaska, and just started riding south, got as far as he could go. Uh, and then Javenna uh, Huang, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Who, uh, I mean, she's just going around the world on a, on a Vespa as well. You know, so. Um, Oh, we also got Ed March and Rachel Lasham. Yeah, so you know, I think it's easy though to to oversell the the thing of doing it on a small bike. You know, oh look at us, we're doing it on a small bike. But you know, sometimes it's just the best form of transport for for a trip like this, and sometimes it's not. It's just one way. Uh, you know, and I think just as much as some people say, oh, you've got to do it on a big bike. There's other people who say you've got to do it on a small bike, but you got to do it on what suits you really. And uh, I mean, I, I'm trying to think. I mean, I moved upwards. I downgraded to a GS1200 a few years after that. Uh, an ex side pave off road trading skills bike that I bought. Um, you know, but I, d I went across America to up uh, with my wife. We got married in Vegas on that trip. I wouldn't wanted to do that on a posty bike. I mean, it could have been possible in theory on a posty bike, but I'm not sure she would have been that comfortable. Uh, and I don't think there would have been a wedding as a result. So sometimes a GS1200 is a brilliant bike. Uh, and then a few years later, we went around Iceland on it which, again, for going around Iceland, when you've got to ride up to Denmark to catch a ferry, a GS1200 is a brilliant bike. Uh, I kind of found my niche since then uh, with the mighty Himalayan. Uh, some people will poo-poo that. I saw a forum post earlier. Somebody was asking, uh, should I get a 390 KTM or a Himalayan? And people say, they get neither, or they certainly not get the Himalayan because it's crap. I thought, well, yeah, so what? But, you know, I had the black one. I did 20,000 miles on that. Did a lot of Land's End, John Groats trips. Uh, around Ireland, I took it across America, uh, on, uh, guiding other people on bigger bikes. And you know what? The Himalayan is a fine machine for overland travel because it, because it's like a big posty bike. It's got all the virtues of a posty bike: simple, durable, 
inelegant, but at the same time, it can do 65, 70 miles an hour. Uh, you can sit on an interstate without getting lorries right up, up your chuffed uh, uh, and it'll get you across states with relative ease in complete luxury compared to the posty bike. And equally, it will allow you to take trails like this that you probably wouldn't tackle if you were loaded up on a GS12, you know, and that's that fine line. It's got the power of the GS12, but it's got the nim nimbleness. Would you want to go two, two up across, the, uh, across America on a Himalayan? No. Uh, I sold that bike, bought another Himalayan. I don't know what time it is. I don't know if I'm running out of time. I do apologize. I tend to babble badly. Uh, but I sold that one and then realized I missed it. And I, I, I bought a second one. Uh, the beauty of the Himalayan is, you know, £3,300. You can pick up a nearly brand new one. Uh, and uh, this one was shipped out to Bulgaria and did a, a ride back from, Bulga from Bulgaria. Um, I think you've got people coming in. Something just caught there. But since then, uh, I guess an adventurer can't rest on his laurels forever or make milk from the same story for the rest of his life. Although that's what I guess what I've just technically done. Um, but I started doing garbage runs. Garbage runs were just an idea to get me back out. I wanted to do Land's End Johnny Groats on Dorothy, who'd been sat idle for a few years. And I said, look, anybody wants to meet me down at Land's End, we'll, we'll ride Land's End Johnny Groats, all the back roads. Uh, and 30 people turned up at Land's End. 2017 this one and they turned up on all sorts of uh, vibrant colorful uh, wonderful machinery uh I, so i've got dorothy out of retirement for this uh you know the beauty of it because we're talking about you know everyone's talk today about big trips but the reality is a Sydney, a, 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 to me it lands into john groats trip if you do it on the back roads it's just as exhilarating as, and as rewarding and ex as exciting as doing sydney to london without all the bull Bullying, bullying between, you know, without all the paperwork and all the days passing through India. You know, if you get on a bike in Land's End and take an interesting route to John O'Groats, you can have a great time on a motorcycle. And that is fundamentally really what it's about. You know, it's not about riding around the world. It's not about riding around Sydney, London. It's not. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's nice if you can do it and if you have that moment when, you, when it's feasible to do it. But if you can't do that, then there's many things you can do on a weekend in a motorcycle, on a motorcycle or a week or two weeks if you're lucky, or, you know, and that's the situation I'm in. You know, we've got a seven-month-old seven baby, a big dog, and, and, a, uh, and a wife. Uh, is, um, you know, and things change, and you've got to make the most of, of your adventure in the time that you can and on the budget you've got. So Land's End to John Groves, you know, with Chris and uh, Chile uh, and um, Dave, and I'm trying to think of that, I can't see who that is at the back. You know, and you go, I mean, look at that, that's Britain. That's north coast of Devon coming out of Lynmouth. Uh, towards Minehead. I mean, who thought Minehead was, would be an adventure capital to aim towards? But if you're coming on that road from Lynmouth, Minehead is, is the Ulaanbaatar of the North Devon coast. So, you know, I think, you know, let's just bring it back to reality and uh, enjoy your miles we can. Dom's bike stop if anybody's in Lemster. You've got to get over to Dom's. Dom's is like being in Thailand, but being in Le just outside Lemster. Uh, his food's amazing. His campsite's good. Uh, you know, and they got people like Connor on his MSX125. He rode Land's End to Johnny Goats and back down again on that bike with all his, his gear. So, you know, there's anybody who says they need certain gear, certain bike, certain something, Connor is the man it proves uh, otherwise. And Matt, military Matt with his, uh, I don't know, he just made, he's, he's the only person I've ever known who could make a C90 look tough and um, quite macho. Uh, I think he's always got his night vision uh, GoPro on his on his helmet that does it, but uh, some great guys. Uh, you know, uh, Mark who bought a C C C B C D two hundred to do the trip. Uh, and, you, know, you start heading for the Highlands of Scotland. That's such a fantastic place up through Glencoe. A little bit busy. I mean, great time to be doing it now. If you could sneak out and go up through Glencoe, there won't be a tourist bus inside at the minute. But uh, I mean, if you hit, hit it in the summer months, it can be a little bit busy. But get a Johnny Groves. You know, you made some good friends. Um, seen some good sights. Got some nice photos, uh, and I mean, you know, it's bound to rain. I think that's it. I took a group across America. I don't know if I'm filling time. Somebody will jump in and tell me if I'm over talking. But I took a, I took a 12, 13 across America, 2018, uh, and we shipped bikes into New York air freight, and then four weeks across to LA, and then shipped them back again. Uh, you know, uh, it's nice doing it with people. It's nice doing it with people to, to, to share that adventure. With. We should be going again in August this year, but. It's looking unlikely. And then last but not least, uh, last year's trips, I did quite a few. To Land's End, Johnny Groats, around Ireland. And the big one was uh, across uh, across Australia uh, on posties. So uh, nine bikes from 110 motorcycles where I got Dorothy from. 
I sourced the bikes, flied the bikes, and we took uh, 21 days, 24 days to go across the outback, uh, so through the uh, Great Central Road, Udnadatta, Strzelecki track, uh, you know, novi some novice riders, some experienced riders, some long, long days, some incidents, a less than perfect trip in some ways, but, uh, you know, everyone survived that trip, and, and, you know, we got to see some of the Australian outback. Those bikes are now back. Uh, I brought them all back to the UK. I'm doing tours. If anybody wants to hit me up for a ride out on a, an official uh, original Aussie post bike, I have nine post posty bikes, U, uh, UK registered now posty bikes. I do just take people on. Uh, I, I just come to cut me out. Uh, posty bike trips uh, around North Devon. Uh, and I'm, a minute, I'm just I'm, I'm just riding one. I've got one more slide. Uh, I'm just riding. I've just finished finishing. The Amazing Adventures of Dorothy, which is Dorothy's interpretation of the Sydney to London route. And I've just got the latest bit of artwork. This is uh, from Chris, who came on my first garbage run. And Chris is doing my illustra illustrations. And this is where Dorothy meets Martha in the foothills of the Himalayan mountains. Okay, then. Great stuff. So that was obviously Nathan Millwood on the Armchair Bench Festival stage all the way back in April, uh, talking about uh, the pros and cons of, uh, I suppose, going adventures on small bikes rather than big ones. Uh, super informative, if that's your sort of, if that's your cup of tea in this adventure world. Um, and if it's not your cup of tea in the adventure world, it was still quite informative, to be fair. So I hope you've enjoyed oh, it. Well, hey? it, wasn't, it wasn't a lecture. It was fun, too, I thought. Yeah, it was fun as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it is fun, isn't it? Nathan's always fun, and he's he runs now a fun little kind of adventure centre down in uh, the southwest as well. Yeah, Dorothy's uh, he's got Dorothy's Speed yeah. Shop, yeah. Um, and he takes people out on little tours. Well, yeah, mate, but I was going to get to that. So, anyway, <laughs> who we got next? <laughs> next up, we've got um, bear with me, come through it, Alsmith Beard. We've got Alfred Beard coming up next. Uh, absolutely brilliant uh, little Q&A with Graham Hoskins of Adventure Bike TV. Yeah, uh, yeah went around the world on a 1974 BMW. <laughs> um, <laughs> first thing about Brit, age of 23. I think it was in 1983 as well, wasn't it? So, yeah, that's <laughs> Alfred Beard coming up next. Um, she chatted with Graham Hoskins, as Matt said. I think you're really going to enjoy this one. So, uh, I'm yeah. Right? You are sorry? I was going to get to that. Oh, sorry. But obviously, no, I was also going to mention that she's an award-winning architect. <laughs> she is an award-winning architect, yeah. So. Yeah, you're quite right. So um, you'll enjoy that one. Obviously, you can watch it now on a Patreon page. Yeah, Patreon page is a dollar a month for a backstage pass. Nothing, you don't get anything for it. So, okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll see you. See you next week. <laughs>